go. Let's get started. All right, to begin, I want to share a, a video with you all. And hopefully this video will, will share a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, this is the name of our program through the Community College of Denver. You have an opportunity to take a chance to learn this program, get your certification and have a great opportunity to start a career. And as far as I'm personally saying, I think it's a really good program that they put together and I'm glad to be a part of it. It seems like uh, these training programs, people or other organization take it more for the commercial purposes. However, here I figured that it's more for the educational purposes and their uh, goal uh, is to educate their students and not just uh, to do the money maintaining. And it's, um, I won't find in any other organization or place where I can go work seven days a week and just pay for the one and that's what is amazing. I'm interested in tech because I think if I ever need some kind of job involving tech experience or needing anything along those lines, then I'll have experience and skills in my pocket. All right. So uh, this was our, our promo video that we used quite a bit. And uh, obviously, a lot of this was pre-COVID uh, time frame when we had it. Uh, once again, I am uh, Professor Lynn Wilson. I've been program chair for the business and economics department for the last three years, but I'm also a social entrepreneur. So why did I start Boot Up Camps? Well, if you take a look at this chart, and I'm also going to share the news article that really triggered it for me. It was back in 2014. And what I noticed was pretty disappointing because my first career was in IT before I switched over into higher ed. And what I noticed is that there weren't the amount of diversity that I guess I would expect over a 20 year span. Uh, especially knowing how dominant the use of technology is in our everyday lives, especially in the workforce. And so when I saw this chart, uh, it really took me aback because I didn't realize that uh, the access and opportunities for students that were wanting to go into the STEM field and the IT field uh, were still pretty spare if you were not going to an Ivy League or high uh, tech school like MIT or near Silicon Valley. Um, no, no shade to any of those colleges or universities that bring out excellent students, but it really created this funnel that wasn't allowing tech workers of color to really have the access uh, if they were African-American or Hispanic, especially. And so if you see these, these statistics, these were back in 2014. And I could easily argue that the needle has not moved much on uh, the tech worker uh, percentage in these major uh, Fortune 500 technology companies. Now, I believe there's a lot of progress that's been made, especially because of uh, the uh, BLM movement and just kind of the, the social consciousness in our culture right now to improve diversity all around. Uh, but we have a lot of work to, to do. And so for me, that was the, the catalyst, but this was really the defense. This was really showing how much the need for folks that have to have technology skills digital literacy, remote worker skills was needed in today's society. Uh, 
I remember seeing this chart and, and doing a lot of research uh, related to this, even for my business students and realizing the workforce of yesterday of the traditional work 20 years in the same place, that's long gone. That's an extinct situation. What you have today are many workers that are gonna have multiple jobs and possibly multiple industries. And so you need to provide them a baseline of certain skill sets in order to uh, not only as we've seen with COVID work remotely, but also to possibly even have entrepreneurial skills so that they can become independent contractors as well. Uh, I just was uh, in the project management, the PMI presentation, and, and she pretty much had similar statistics related to the importance of having project management skills. And I think if you interpolate those two together with digital literacy, technology skills, along with project management, uh, those are going to be some of the, the more valuable skill sets. And it is surprising, I'm sure, and shocking to see that, you know, half of the workforce is anticipated to be freelance, or I would argue, uh, instead of using the word freelance remote work, we know that that's possible now. And so I don't think it's a surprise to see that the majority of the U.S. workforce could become remote uh, or some hybrid, uh, even in our field as teachers and administrators. So a little bit about uh, us as an organization. We um, are... Mission is to attract, empower, equip students and non-students alike from underserved, underrepresented communities to enter the STEM, STEM fields, especially in IT, business, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing. So if you were here earlier, you saw the video, you saw that we created a lot of events, uh, a lot of uh, activity around attracting folks from underserved communities to participate uh, in our programs. And so what we do well is provide those high quality, high demand workplace skills training to really uh, give them certifications. And we recognize that CertiCorp provides a lot of these great certifications at the entry level that can help students really get their foot in the door. And so uh, we use IC3 is our main flagship certification. We also do Microsoft Office specialist certifications, as well as ESB, the entrepreneur and small business certification. Those are our main uh, drivers that we train our, our students in. So how did we get started? We, we started back in 2017. We obtained a grant from the community college system. They had a, uh, a round of funding for innovative grants and I had submitted that grant to them. And uh, from that grant, it gave us uh, about 15 to 18 months to execute the idea and the concept. And what we ended up doing was providing, uh, my, my initial thought was we were gonna do a lot of boot camps, which were gonna be the short training camps, eight weeks or less, that we would just start out doing that and people would show up. But what really helped to funnel students to attend were these one-day test drives, where we basically would have a half-day workshop just introducing students that may have not even been to our campus before to what we would kind of teach them for the full eight week camp. And so we had uh, the manufacturing day, which was very popular with the high school students. We had um, PC troubleshooting was very, also very popular. And then we also did a couple of mixer events where we had things like uh, pitch night for entrepreneurs and startup fest, you know, where we were really trying to tap into that entrepreneur 
working for yourself attitude that a lot of our uh, population has now. But we did end up having quite a few uh, boot camps, you know, the traditional uh, one or two times a week. Uh, sometimes they would be four hours long, sometimes they would be six hours long. It just depended on which uh, certification we were training them in. But the key was really to make them as short as possible, uh, to get the maximum output with the minimum time. Today, we still run uh, boot camps. And obviously, with COVID, we had to pivot from doing them uh, live to, to virtual. Uh, so although our grant ended in 2018, uh, we had so much demand from our community partners that we have built up that uh, we were able to keep going. Uh, we were able to subsidize the cost to the students by charging those uh, community, community partners to pay for the tuition for those students. Uh, that was always our mission as well. We wanted to keep the cost very low because we recognized that that also was a barrier to entry for many of these students. And because none of our boot camps are, are uh, financial aid supported, we had to figure out ways to, to keep those costs subsidized to the student. And so when COVID did hit, we were already preparing our camps to be cloud-based uh, thanks to Gmetrics software. Uh, it really did allow us to pivot pretty quickly. Uh, we went from, you know, uh, an example of this class right here. Uh, we had about 15 students in that class. And then we had another group cohort that was at another building uh, at a, a totally different school. And so we were able to still retain about half of those students, even though, you know, everybody was scared and worried about what was going to happen with COVID. The, the hardest, heaviest lift was really to retrain our students to uh, learn how to use video conferencing like Zoom and WebEx. So um, other than that problem, it, it, it really was uh, great to be able to use, to go from on-site to virtual. And on top of that, our virtual training has really showed better improvement and completion. We've improved by 43% simply by switching our whole uh, training virtually online. And we do run synchronized classes. So it's not uh, asynchronous in terms of, you know, pre-recording videos. We do have those, but we definitely still prefer with this audience to run synchronous classes. And typically we run them uh, twice a week. So yeah, we went from on-site to virtual. And here's just one snapshot of our impact. Um, our numbers aren't like thousands of students, but you have to understand the, the type of students that we've attracted. We've attracted students from ages 16 to 60 plus that most of them would not even step on a college campus. Uh, they're allergic to the word university in some cases. Where these are folks that, that are parents. These are folks that may have been labeled at risk. These are folks that may not have done well uh, when they were younger in high school and felt like they didn't have what it took to be successful in college. So we're, we're also providing kind of like that test drive of what a college environment is without the formality. It was a very informal for, format. Uh, and so in 2019, we had 54 students that uh, did the IC3 certification training. And in um, 2020, we actually increased our students. You would think that that number would significantly go down because of COVID, but like I said, I think the uh, actually running them virtual provided more accessibility to the target audiences that we were trying to impact. Not to mention that 
because we were also doing the testing at home, that also lowered another barrier. And we were actually able to get more students to be able to pass more certifications because uh, the convenience of being at home. So let's look a little bit at the operations. Uh, there are a lot of players that, that need to be in place, um, but sometimes you can have one or two people that can play multiple roles, but I wanted to like help show you who really is necessary and what are their roles and responsibilities. So when you look at the uh, first component, it's the recruiter. That's someone who, once you make a connection with a, either a group, you know, it could be a community organization. Uh, for instance, we worked with the Urban League and the Mile High United Way. We needed someone on our team that would follow up with whoever that point of contact is who could help build a cohort. And a lot of times our recruiter would build that cohort from those community organizations, because a lot of times the community organizations themselves would not have a, a consistent recruiter that could go out and, and just gather everybody up. So they're, they're key. They're, that recruiter is ultimately the person that's going to help you get butts and seat. Um, trainers, obviously, you, you can't do this work without having a subject matter expert. We require that that instructor would have years of experience um, and definitely using the software, definitely having the certifications themselves uh, so that not only did they understand the uh, topics, you know, but also understand the process, right? Having to register for CertiPort, having to um, know the different questions and and, and kind of know what to anticipate as they went through the same process as the students that they're teaching. Uh, retainers, you know, we had tutors and navigators. Um, tutors were really helpful because what we started doing as we began having more and more cohorts with graduates, we would take some of the top students that were finishing, uh, for instance, IC3, you know, if we gave them eight weeks to complete IC3, we would have some students that could complete it in four or five weeks. And we keep tabs on those students. And if they didn't have any work opportunities after getting the certification, we would actually hire them to be tutors for the next cohort so that they could help uh, kind of peer tutor the uh, other students that might be struggling in the class. And we found that to be very effective, especially around the holidays. Uh, navigators were more the, I want to say, kind of the, the soft skill resources. We had not only almost like a personal coach or a personal motivator on our team, but we also would have navigators that could help with real, real issues like food insecurity, housing insecurity, child care, transportation. That na navigator would be the point of contact to deal with those kind of issues. And because uh, the city of Denver has a lot of great resources for folks struggling, you know, low income and those kind of support, that navigator would, would direct those uh, students to, to utilize those resources. Uh, obviously, you also want a proctor. I think having the proctor on your team uh, is very helpful and efficient. Um, we actually, when we were on site doing the training, we would do some of our training right next to the school's testing center. And you would be surprised or maybe not, but some of the students, even though it was right, like literally a hallway down from where we were training, someone would still be nervous to take the exam. And we would almost like have to push, pull and drag them over to the physically down the hall to the testing center um, just to take the test. And for whatever reason, uh, a lot of the, our students uh, were, were a lot more comfortable when they were able to do it virtually. They didn't have to worry about finding childcare. 
They didn't have to worry about driving to a testing center. So, so it did eliminate some of those barriers for sure. Um, and then a career coach. I wanted to add that because career coach, you know, what good is getting these certifications? What good is it getting a degree if it doesn't help you get your foot in the door into placement, into either an internship or an apprenticeship or some entry level job or even some mid level job if they if, if it's the right certification. So that career coach was in place to really take that student who had just completed the certification and get their resume brushed up, get their cover letter ready and really help identify some of those uh, hiring organizations that could come alongside that career coach to help place that student and give them a chance, even if it was a temporary uh, employment. It was still, for a lot of our students, kind of their first time experience in a different workplace environment that wasn't dealing with like your hands or retail, like essential worker type jobs. So I know many of you might be wondering, okay, what are, what are some of the costs? What, what are some, some, some things we can anticipate in terms of uh, putting this all together? And my quick and dirty answer is it, it really depends. It depends on how many certifications you wanna launch with. Uh, we launched with just two. We were initially doing uh, CompTIA with the A plus and Network Plus and ESP. Uh, but some of the costs might be, you know, cost effective. Some might be a little more expensive. Uh, but we found the, the biggest expense usually was with the overhead of the staff, uh, especially because our subject matter experts were primarily professors. I was fortunate enough to have a lot of, uh, of my colleagues who were willing to, to do these non-credit courses. Uh, but they also were not cheap to pay to do this stuff. But at the same time, uh, when we had the grant, it was subsidized. Uh, uh, you know, we were able to pay them through our grant. Um, the G metrics software and the learn key software is really, to me, like the, the secret sauce to what makes our camp so efficient and effective. Uh, I feel like the learn key courseware in and of itself is almost like a teacher in a box. Theoretically, you could use just learn key courseware to teach the classes, but to me, the real connection and the real engagement has to do with that subject matter expert, that instructor who's guiding the students along every week, um, making their presentations about understanding whether it's Microsoft Office, you know, and all the different features and just guiding people through. To me, that's the real engagement. So I wouldn't recommend just running a course and just saying, hey, here's Learn Key, you know, have at it. You definitely want to have that instructor who's there and guiding students along. Um, because I, I think that's key. And that's where the mentorship also comes into play, especially when we look at some of the other costs that sometimes the participants have to worry about. Uh, so exam vouchers, you definitely want to be aware of that cost. You know, exam vouchers depend on which, once again, which certification you're doing. Some are very inexpensive, like IC3. Those are a little bit over $30 a piece. Um, proctoring, I highly, highly recommend if you aren't already established as a testing center to connect with whoever your sort of port representative is and, and become a testing center. It makes the costs and the, the convenience so much easier when you are able to control the proctoring. Um, or, and also there's little inconveniences with that too. Uh, like I mentioned, if you, have, if you don't have a testing center on your campus, where will those students go? And sometimes those students, at least in our case, would make a lot of excuses about why they couldn't get to a testing center. So the easier you, you can make it for them to access the testing center, the better your results will be on them actually taking the exam and passing the exam. So 
we are, I also uh, want you to be mindful about what the cost would be on the participant side. The participants have a lot to do with this uh, as well. And sometimes uh, when you're working with underserved, underrepresented communities, they may have some economical issues that you wanna take into consideration. And some of these costs, you might even be able to cover as the host, right? Like within your tuition, maybe you include, you know, a bus pass or something like that, or a Uber or Lyft pass. Childcare was a major, major issue, but we were very, very fortunate to, have, to partner with a community uh, grant funded organization called uh, SWIFI, Strengthening Working Families Initiative. And they actually reimbursed parents for childcare costs. So if there was any issues with child care, you know, they really wanted to go to our, uh, physically, to our um, training, they would cover child care costs. But that's something you need to think about. Uh, food, believe it or not. We, uh, we like to provide food, especially when we're doing our Friday uh, all-day camps. We would, we would provide it. We would provide, you know, uh, lunch. Uh, we would provide little breakfast snacks. It's those little touches those little extra customer service things that really helped with retention. Um, our retention was very high. We, we hardly lost any students through any of these camps. Um, tuition is something that usually, like I said, can be offset if you find those community partners that will sponsor students. And that's been our primary strategy. Um, we really don't like to charge to uh, high tuition to the general public, mainly because we know who we're trying to target will not have the tuition. They won't have that, that money. Um, but it's not to say you can't. As a matter of fact, we, we still did charge to the general public because there were students that were interested in taking it. Um, and that price range would, is, would generally be, like I said, depends on the subsidies but it would be as low as $500 per student all the way up to $1,300 per student. So here are some things I, I want you to take away. Um, these are some key strategies that I want you to think about. First of all, your marketing and outreach. How are you going to get that first cohort? All right. First of all, you need to find your tribe. I already explained to you what was the impetus for me. I shared the link in, my, in the chat that I understood mainly because I was in that same predict predicament 20 years ago that when I was in, an I, in the IT field in, you know, not necessarily senior level positions, but like uh, analyst positions, no matter what boardroom I was in, there were hardly any folks of color. And so for me, that was my strong point. But I think there's a lot of other tribes that have a big need. I think about rural. That's a big market. I think about um, what else? Oh, the Native American. Uh, if you are in a community college that's near a reservation. I think that would be a great, great market. Uh, Metro Denver, we have a very large Hispanic market. Our, uh, the community college that I work at is a HSI, meaning a Hispanic serving institution, where we have over 30% of our population is, has a Latinx background. And so they very much are part of our marketing and outreach. And uh, so I think that's really important to know who are you going to target first? And then how are you going to rally them? I would uh, say that look for organizations that already serve those tribes and that's the easiest route to go. The second key strategy is thinking about what's your menu? How, what are you going to offer? First of all, which certification do you think will be the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, right? For us, it switched from doing 
CompTIA A plus to IC3. Why? Because even though we were already doing it before COVID, it was unbelievable the demand from stakeholders like workforce centers saying, hey, we need folks that have you know, remote skills, digital literacy skills. And a lot of these folks that were coming through were not, didn't, didn't have the skills. Everyone thinks that just because you know how to use a smartphone, you, you automatically have digital literacy skills. Well, if you can't tell the difference between RAM and ROM, if you can't speak the, the nomenclature, right? The jargon that's out there in the, in the industry, you're not gonna go far. You'll fake it for a minute, but, but some, somehow, you know, it, it's easy to know who really has the skills and who doesn't. Even as a, as a chair, I know which one of my instructors are rock stars and which ones are still struggling to get on board with teaching remote. So number three, another key, get, get good stakeholder support. Find that whale as we would say in Vegas, right? If you're in Vegas, the whales are the ones that Vegas goes for, right? The big money folks. Well, it's sort of the same in education, right? If you can get someone who really supports it, who's really connected, that's usually how you'll get your, your uh, first cohort because they may know a lot more people than you do. And they will be able to help you to, to get folks signed up. Uh, we were very fortunate. We had quite a few uh, key stakeholders and uh, as well as major benefactors that could help us really get pull uh, uh, from, uh, from that population. Um, another thing I want you to keep in mind is don't think that you have to fund this alone. Uh, I think what has kept us alive without grant funding has been partnering with public sometimes partners as well as private partners that do get funded. And although they are really good at writing the grants, they may not be so good at executing the grant. They may say, hey, we need to do training related to remote learning. And you, can come in and say, well, we can help with that. We can provide this certification. Do you have anybody in place that is doing the technical assistance for that? Nine times out of 10, at least when we were doing our partnerships, they did. They had the money, but they didn't have the execution. And we would come in and kind of be like the Ghostbusters and help them to execute what they beautifully written in a grant. Uh, I already mentioned this before, but a convenient testing center is very important. Um, I can't underline that enough because you can do all this great training for these students and they can be prepared and they're doing the practice exams and geometrics. And yet, where, where are they going to take the real thing? You want to have that lined up way ahead of time because you kind of, you want to schedule those students ahead of time as well. You want them to anticipate that, hey, you're, you're learning all this for two reasons. One, to get your skills up, to get a better job or to move up the ladder, but also to pass. And so uh, having that testing center uh, location and knowing where that is, is, is important. And then lastly, hiring partners. Having those hiring partners in place, um, really, I think, ha is, is the best carrot you can have, right? Even though you'll have students passing the certifications, do they have jobs lined up? Do you have partners already lined up where you can just plug those students right in and say, hey, congratulations, now we're going to have you intern over here or, or work over here as even as a customer service rep. These are the kind of opportunities that are uh, audience may not have had if they didn't go through our camps. Okay, so just to to uh, rehash, uh, what's in it for for you? Well, I think there's there's two sides to this coin, right? I think that um, one side of the coin is 
what's in it for you as the host organization. I also think that what's in it for that participant. I think it's very important to take the participant's point of view as well because of who you're trying to target. You're trying to target folks that don't see STEM as sexy, y'all. You're, ta you're targeting folks that may not really have thought about IT related jobs as their career pathway. Um, and yet these are the best opportunities and, and in my opinion, some of the best paying jobs, at least from entry level standpoint that could really usher them in to the middle class in less than two years. And so from the host organization, I definitely think it improves community outreach. Like I said, you're partnering with NGOs, you're partnering with public organizations and private organizations that are pretty much doing social good. So to see your organization also partnered up with them, especially if you're a college or university, is, is good PR as well. You know, it gets your name out there more as like, okay, they're actually not waiting for students to come to their campus. We're, they're actually coming to us. Develops a new revenue stream. Uh, that definitely was the case for us. We tested uh, early on whether or not we could actually generate revenue from our camps. Uh, we tested that model out because we were not funded to provide awards and, and, and food and things like that. So we wanted to provide food for our students. So we started charging for our uh, one day uh, test drives, our workshops, and people were happily paying anywhere from 20 bucks to 99 bucks. Uh, and, and although, you know, that didn't seem like a lot of money per student, though it added up and we were easily covering our, our food costs and in some cases, transportation costs for the students. Um, it also increases enrollment or, organically. Uh, believe it or not, you know, there were students that were just there to get the certification so that they could tell the workforce, hey, I got the certification, help me get a job. A lot of those students would convert into either part-time college students or full-time college students. Because like I said, the connection with that professor who in our case was usually teaching the class, they would help connect them to either the right college or the advisor and help them get to that next step. So it is, really is a great handshake method to increasing enrollment with folks that may or may not have ever uh, thought about enrolling in your school. Um, also, I, you know, this may be a case for you. It can help diversify your population. And when I say diversify, it doesn't necessarily have to be people of color, it could be income brackets. We know that there's a lot of schools that have a high barrier entry simply because they're expensive to go there. So this could be a, a one way to even bring students that would never come to your campus to your campus uh, as we you know, move on post COVID and, and get, give them exposure, give them inspiration, give them hope that they can do this. And as I mentioned, uh, the costs really vary, but I would say the overhead of just running the camps is reasonably low. Uh, and you don't have to do it constantly. You can do it like, uh, we started doing them seasonally, every you know, semester. We would base our, our camps around semesters. And so it, it, it can be done however you want them done. You can do one a year if you wanted to or you can do them very frequently. We, at one point we were doing uh, every four weeks. So every month we were having camps at one point. Uh, so what does the participant get from this? The participant gets work ready skill sets. And of course, with use and CertiPort, they get industry recognized certifications. They get untapped support and resources. Uh, here's a big selling point as well. We have a system in place called PLA, Prior Learning Assessment. 
which is if they pass certain certifications, they will get college credit for that certification. So in other words, they can get this put on one of our transcripts as passing a college course without having to go to the real college course. In some ways, you didn't hear this from me, but it, I would argue that some of this certification training is actually more effective in really teaching them hands-on stuff than an actual college course that is teaching them this stuff. You didn't hear that from the program chair though. Uh, long-term commitment, no long-term commitment. You would be surprised how, well, maybe not in this day and age, but that is a big attraction for new students these days. Hey, can I get in and out? Because I have kids, I have a job, I, I have multiple jobs because I got a piece this part-time one with this part-time, I don't have time for this, but I do have time for something short because I tired of burning the candle at both ends. So if you can get me in, get me out, get me trained, sure, I'll go for it. All right, so any questions? Here's my contact information. I appreciate everybody uh, being on here.